Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Orthodox Banter with Boyan. I'm the Boyan in question. I'm a reader of the Serbian Orthodox Church and I'm here to answer your questions on Eastern Orthodox Christianity from my own personal knowledge and experience. Feel free to leave any questions that you may have in the comments below. And today's question comes from, uh, comes from M's DIY. Her question is, could you please explain how having icons is different from the second commandment? Please, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, M, for your question. And yes, having icons were a, uh, was a very contentious issue, especially in the Eastern Orthodox, uh, in the, especially in the Eastern Roman Empire in 8th and 9th century. However, the Church has condemned uh, any opposition to the icons as heresy of iconoclasm. Uh, the iconoclasts claim that icons were idols, and I hope to present here in a very brief form how that was false. Uh, first, let me read the second commandment for you. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under earth. Thou shalt not bow down to, uh, thou shalt not bow thy, thou yourself to them, nor serve them. You know, it says here, uh, or uh, water under earth. So technically, if something lives in water that is not under the earth, clearly you can <laughs> grave that image. <laughs> okay, but joking aside, um, if we apply this commandment strictly, we are not to make any sort of graven image. Uh, this includes icons, statues, paintings, photography, TV, YouTube videos. So if, uh, if you were to accept this very strictly, you would uh, not uh, be allowed <laughs> to watch and hopefully enjoy these sorts of videos. Uh, however, the injunction here is clearly against idolatry. And there we are in a bit of an issue because the Bible does not really spell out what idolatry is apart from it clearly being, um, uh, f uh, you know, uh, forbidding worship of other gods than the one true God. And icons are sort of problematic there because they depict one true God, but also his saints. So how can we resolve this conundrum? Well, uh, it's actually simple. How are icons different from idols? First of all, an idol is something that is worshipped as it were God. Technically, an icon can become an idol if it is worshipped as God. However, I think that uh, a really basic and cursory training in Christianity 101 is enough to prevent us from falling in such a grievous error. In fact, uh, St. John of Damascus, one of the pioneers of icon veneration in the Church, has clearly stated that we do not worship the matter, but we venerate or honor whoever is depicted on the icon in the case of saints or worship the God that is depicted on icon in the case of Jesus Christ. So uh, that is one difference. However, uh, if we look at different kinds of idolatries, we can also clearly see that not all pagans considered idols to be God, you know, there was a sort of iconographic paganism, uh, if you will, where an idol was a representation of God. It wasn't thought to be God of uh, God itself. So again, what's the difference between a Christian icon and a pagan idol that's not directly, uh, directly seen to be God? Well, again, it's very simple. An icon represents a falsehood, you know, it represents Jupiter, it represents Zeus, it represents Vajet, it represents whatever deity of pagans that we know are false. There is no Zeus, there is no Jupiter, there is no Vajet, there is <laughs> at best, and this best is a really horrid thing, there is a demon uh, who is taking the guise of all of these different de deities and leading people astray, you know. However, with icons, we have actual reality behind them. There is a woman who gave birth to our God. Her name is Mary. There is a real God called Jesus Christ. And there is his resurrection and so on and so forth. There is a martyr called George and so on. So uh, icons represent reality. Okay, but again, you might say, well, 
then why uh, weren't these uh, uh, all all of these saints? Why weren't they allowed uh, before, uh, like in the Old Testament? Very simple, because Christ hasn't died and hasn't arisen yet. We we weren't given life. However, after his death and resurrection, we are free to portray these people because uh, before uh, the death and resurrection of Christ, all of the dead went into abode of the dead, Sheol, Hades, uh, however you want to call this, um, uh, uh, this abode of the dead. And thus you really couldn't even evoke them in prayer because they were, weren't truly alive. However, after, after uh, Christ's descent into Hades, all of these souls of the righteous and probably many sinners, it's a bit sketchy, were uh, redeemed by Christ into the kingdom of life and light. And therefore, that is why we can invoke them in prayer. And that is why God is God of the living, not of the dead. Uh, then you might say, well, why were we forbidden to depict God? Very simple. How do you depict immaterial, immaterial deity? You can't. There is no way to actually depict it. However, after, uh, after uh, Son of God became man in incarnation, we can actually depict Christ because he became a living, breathing human being. And it would be the exact same uh, if we were able to take a photograph of Jesus Christ at his time. You know, that is what icon is, in a way, you know, because uh, we are portraying him who died for us, who loved us, who in the end made us. And your final objection might be, okay, well, yes, that is God, and those were saints who were imprisoned in Sheol, but then were redeemed by Christ. What about angels? Uh, why wasn't their depiction forbidden? Well, it wasn't. I mean, that is why you have all of the cherubim uh, on the tabernacle, on the whales, in the end, on the mercy, uh, above the mercy seat, on the ark, uh, meaning essentially that an iconographic depiction was at the very epicenter of old Jewish worship. You know, these weren't merely ornaments. And uh, when you look at an Orthodox church, any um, Orthodox church that has proper funding or, or is at the very least uh, historical, you can see that it sort of mirrors uh, the tabernacle because uh, you have the whale separating the Holy of the Holies and the Holy Place in the same way the iconostasis separates the altar area from the nave. However, in, the, in, in New Israel, in the church, we actually have humans depicted there as well because we have been redeemed by the blood of our God, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, that, is, uh, that is the gist of it. Um, I do hope I was of some use to you. Uh, this is again a very uh, this is a very long topic. Um, again, uh, one of the reasons why iconoclasts forbade use of iconography was because they essentially said, "Well, you can't really uh, depict divinity on an icon," and they sort of fell very strongly into the heresy of Nestorianism by claiming that uh, icons were of essential use to Christianity. Uh, there are some things that we take too much for granted, for example, uh, like literacy. Uh, icons were so to, sort of scripture for the illiterate. And it was much easier to actually convey teachings of Christianity when you actually had some samples of iconography in the Christian church. Not to mention that even when you take, for example, a religion that is so, so anti-idolatry, but then even it has a sort of this iconographic approach, for example, Islam. Uh, I don't think that any Muslim thinks that Quran is God, but if you were to trample on Quran, you would be saying something, even though uh, it's technically not a blasphemy because Quran isn't God. However, it stands there for God. It represents God, also for the Jews, also for uh, iconoclast Christians. There is always something that isn't God, but we take as blasphemy when it is destroyed. For example, a cross that even that even the most iconoclastic of Christians tend to use. I hope I was some some use to you, and I do hope that 
the icons that our church blesses and uses in its worship are of use to you for you to express your love for God and for them to teach you what is proper way of our life in the future. Goodbye and bye.